Good evening, everyone. Today is December 19th, 2016, and welcome to Veterans Voices, a monthly talk show focusing on veterans issues, your issues. I'm Nathan Johnson, the Contra Costa County Veteran Service Officer, and I'm joined by my co-host, Gold Star Father and CalVet Link, Kevin Graves. Hey, Nathan. Hey, Kevin. Our show tonight is called This Is My Child. There are many like it, but this one is mine. Our discussion is on child development and parenting. We've assembled for you a panel of guests who are experts in this topic, but we also need your input. Reach out to us by phone, email, anonymous chat, or send a message through social media for your questions, comments, or to share your story. Tonight we have a very special treat for those of you who contact us. That's right, Kevin. I'm glad you mentioned that. I want you to pay attention here. The first 12 viewers who contact us with a question or a comment, just call into the show, email, chat, it's that easy. You'll receive a signed copy of My Military Dad Does Things a Little Different. It's a children's book written by our guest who will be on the show later, Vincent Vargas, who will be joining us by Skype. We have the exciting opportunity to talk with someone remotely. Uh, he's calling all the way from Texas and he'll share about his book and his experiences of being a father uh, who served in the military. Uh, so we'd now like to welcome our panel of guests. I'm very excited about tonight's panels. And uh, Dee Dee, uh, Teacher Dee Dee, as I know her best. <laughs> Sue and Tito, and welcome all to the set. Thanks for being here tonight. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. So we want to have a, a discussion tonight about parenting. And we're not trying to teach anyone how to be a parent. And we're not trying to make them feel maybe inadequate as parents. We just simply want to have a, a conversation about what the perspective of a child development expert is, Didi, or of being a parent, a veteran, Tito, or being a military spouse. So there's a lot to think about in this topic. I'm a parent as well. Kevin, of course, you raised your son, Joey. Uh, until he joined the army and yep. went off. Um, so a lot, a lot of talk of, uh, to talk about here. But uh, first, let's introduce ourselves a little bit better to to our guest. So, Didi, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'm I'm your child's preschool teacher. Right. I'm a, but also the director and the teacher, and the um, parent educator at at our school. Clayton Valley Parent Preschool in Concord. <laughs> Clayton Valley Which is Parent excellent. Preschool. And as yes. you shared with me earlier, I shared with all of us actually, mm -hmm. uh, both your father and your father-in-law served in the military, yes. your uncle, yes. and your sister. Yes. In fact, you had a role in when your sister was in the military mm -hmm. in helping to care for her son, your nephew, right. who then later on joined the military himself, right? Yes. So lots of experience there in regards to your family. So thank yeah. you. Tito, tell us a little bit about yourself. How you guys doing? My name is Tito Ramos. I'm a Marine Corps vet. I uh, served five years as an avionicsman for the CH-53 helicopter. I uh, had two deployments, uh, one to Iraq in 2008 and the second one on the 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit in 2010. And I have two children. And you were in Pakistan for the second one, right? Yes, I was. Okay. And two kids, how old? Ten and four. All right. Two boys. Tito Jr. and Tito Jr. Jr. Basically, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Angela. Yes, sir. Okay. Sue, welcome to the show, and tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm Sue Craven, and my daughter is in active um, Air Force, and she's deployed at this time. Um, um, I do work, and I'm a stay-home person. But there's more to the story, Sue, and we have to get you going here, because your daughter is the Millie Bass, who is a part of our production crew and has been in Afghanistan for about three months. Yes. But you raised Millie and her younger brother. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember his name. Ethan. Ethan, thank you. Yes. So you raised uh, Millie and Ethan as a military spouse. Your husband served in the in yeah, branch. Yeah, it's true. They were military brats. <laughs> They're military brats. Yes. For 30 years, your husband served in the military. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yes. So thank you all for being here. And where do we start? You know, kids are very special. I have two of them myself, a three-year-old and a six-year-old. But it's it's quite a challenge. i got to say, uh, being a parent is probably one of the most challenging things that I've ever done in my life. Dee Dee, what, you know a lot about, about children. Help us understand a little bit about who kids are at a very young age and how they progress when they get older into maybe their teenage years. Well, you know, I went back to school when my daughter was two. And right away when you start taking the classes, they're so pertainable to everything that you're dealing with as your child is growing. Because their, you know, their little brains are not developed like our brains are developed. So a lot of times we'll, we'll talk to them like we would talk to anybody but they don't have the, the 
the background, they don't have the knowledge yet. Mm -hmm. So we're giving them we're giving them those skills. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what makes it kind of difficult, you know, when you're talking to your younger kids because we give them vocabulary but they don't necessarily have the comprehension. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just understanding that their their little brain is developing right. and just not as fine tuned as as ours are. So when we're giving it to them, are we are we giving it to them directly by actually teaching and instructing them, or is a lot of what we give them just through observation and maybe through our own behaviors and our own personality? Well, sure, modeling. Modeling. Modeling is like the most important, and talking, just talking to them. Mm -hmm. You know, not lecturing, not reprimanding or demanding. Teaching, talking. So part of what we're we're talking about in the show is. Um, the challenges of mm -hmm. um, having one parent not be part of that mm -hmm. for a while while they deploy and the difficulties that go along with that right. and how that works through a lifetime of um, uh, for military personnel and how they and, and when they're in deployment how they're not a part of that family or one might have had a lead role and then all of a sudden that changes mm -hmm. uh, as as uh, somebody as, as, as a mother or father deploys um, how does that how, what how does that how did the how do the kids react to that well it, it's a huge <laughs> adjustment because you know they have that one primary parent at home mm -hmm. the the whole time and then the other parent comes in just wanting to just step right in and right. and take that active role but the child really doesn't have that connection mm -hmm. with them right. um, you know and we always automatically think that they're just going to be so thrilled to see that parent come home. Right. Um, I kind of liken it to when a new baby is brought into the house. Mm -hmm. You know, the parents are all happy. Oh, we're so happy. You're going to love your new little baby. And the child was perfectly happy before. So it's, it's a huge adjustment. It's it, not it just, be, oh, you're back. It may right. be initially exciting mm -hmm. to see dad come home right. or mom come home initially, yeah. but then all of a sudden patterns change. Right. The routines, everything changes for the whole family. Right. You know, those stay at home yeah. parent had everything running, and then in comes the. And I see that in my own family when I'm gone, and I have the luxury, I've never deployed. Right. I, I had my children yeah. way after I left the military, so I've never had to leave for months at a time or even years, mm -hmm. like some families. Um, but when I'm gone for a couple of days, I come home, and they're almost wondering, who is this guy? In fact, I think my daughter asked my wife one time, Mommy, why does dad, why does daddy sleep with us, or why does he stay the night? Or I was just kind of wondering. But that's after being gone for a couple of days. Tito, you were gone. Yeah, I, was say. I mean, your story is very unique. Tell us a little bit about the time, the sacrifice, and the time that you had away from your family. Yeah, so in 2006, um, I just got married maybe a year or two before that, and I just brought her home, and for some reason I thought it'd be a great idea to leave and join the Marines. So I left. Uh, my, my wife was pregnant. At the time, I couldn't sell my home because in Stockton at that time, you couldn't, you couldn't sell anything. Mm -hmm. So they stayed up here while I was gone. So um, for the first couple of years, my son didn't know who I was. I'd come home every couple months for about two or three days, and he was just, he was, he was afraid of me. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, he was uh, you know, scared to look at me sometimes. And so it would take about two or three days for him to get used to me, and by that time, I'm leaving again. Right. So it was, yeah, it took about a little over two and a half years um, before he actually actually ran up to me and hugged me on his own after and my first how appointment. How old was he when you got out, Tito? He was almost five, five okay. years old. He was okay. in, like, preschool and, when I came and, home. Um, how did that, how has that worked now? He's, he's 10 now, so you've been, it's five years of you being around. Um, but do you think that there was any, any... Oh, it, it, we're just now starting to get a relationship together. Yeah. Um, almost like what, what Didi said, um, coming home, you know, the mom, you know, my wife, and, and they already had things going. She was in charge. She was like the new alpha. And we never saw eye to eye on, on a lot of things. Um, so it, it's been a real, it's been a challenge. But like I said, we're actually doing a lot better. Um, we actually talk and communicate. I've kind of was able to calm myself down a little bit, you know, from my role as, as a Marine and a Sergeant and thinking, you know, what I say goes, you know, I, I, I couldn't rule with the iron fist, you know, this wasn't the Marine Corps anymore, so. Well, more to talk about this, and this is the fantastic thing about tonight's episode, is it's not just up on the stage talking about parenting and child development and sharing our perspectives and uh, really asking our questions as hosts, but it's an opportunity for you tonight to chime in with your questions, your comments. You can call us. Our phone lines are open. You can ask a, ch uh, a question by chat, email. We're even Facebook Live right now. So we have a question, and this was the first one's for you, Didi. So, Didi, 
the question is, when you have a seven-year-old with a learning difference, how would it be best to share with them their difference and to advocate for them at church, school, in the scouts, etc.? Wow. That, that's pretty complex, actually. Um, I don't know about actually sharing uh, the difference mm -hmm. um, because you, they just have their own normal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and you just bring in whatever outside advantages you can use or, or whatever, um, mm -hmm. but not necessarily sitting down and talking about it as a difference. So I assume maybe what they're talking about here is maybe there's a learning disability yeah. or some type of um, uh, other type of disorder or such, right? And so what you're saying is that to them, although we identify them as being different, they don't identify that. They identify right. as being normal. Yeah. And so what you're saying is to bring in their strengths. So mm -hmm. how would you work that into when other kids start to think that they're different and maybe sit, make some comments to them? This is a tough question. This has nothing it, to do with military it veterans. It really but, is a tough question. But I think question. it's good because I think veterans are asking this right. question potentially. And this is not something you learn in the military, right? Well, typically if your child has any kind of a learning um, difficulty, there are steps you take, I mean, through early intervention to, to once they get to be three years old and they get to go into the school district. And so there's, they get plans written for them mm -hmm. that helps give them the strategies that they need to be successful because that's mm -hmm. ultimately what you want it to do is for the child to be successful. You know, and if somebody says, oh, well, you're different, it's like, well, you know, I'm me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you. I appreciate that you shared that. And great question. And please continue to ask questions. We want to hear from you. If there's something you want to know, if there's a story that you have, uh, please share that story with us tonight. So real quickly, we have something for you, Sue. And it's Millie, who uh, has sent us a message all the way from Afghanistan. And it says, Sue, thank you, Mom, for all that you have sacrificed for Ethan and I. I love you, and I'm so proud of you. Much love from Afghanistan. Oh. That was sweet of her. That's neat. We, yeah. I think that's the first question or comment we've gotten from Afghanistan. Yeah, so that's probably pretty cool. The furthest one. <laughs> and how neat that it was for you. So. I, I am so proud of my daughter and my mm -hmm. son. Um, I remember her when, she, when her dad had to go. Um, she was saying, I'll never do that. I'll never do that. That's just not going to be me. Well, I didn't expect her to join the military, and she yeah. did. Wow. Um, and I'm very proud of her. Okay. Um, it's hard. It really is. I'd like her here and give her a big hug, you know, mm -hmm. but she's doing something that's better. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk about, you know, the last question was in regards to differences. And I don't think military families are all that different. Um, you know, veterans are great parents. I mean, Tito, you're a great example of that. And Sue, you're a great example of that. Military families are very strong. In yes. fact, you probably have some examples of military families that you've worked with at the school. Can you give us an example of maybe how military families can be different but yet strong? And or what strengths do they have as parents to, to really be good with their children? Right. Well, um, I... When we had talked earlier, I'd mentioned that I've had a lot of Coast Guard families at my school. Right. Um, and the parents just jump right in. Usually it's the, the husband that is out. Um, Deployed. And it's yeah. typically had been the wife that I've worked with. Mm -hmm. um, right. But they jump right into like leadership roles at our school. Like my, one of them was my president. Okay. Because big just, responsibility. Big responsibility, right. but yet she was used to being able to move their family, you know, from one state to another state, uh -huh. cross country. So she was a used to change. Then. Yes, right. she was. Uh, sadly, they had to leave our school mid-year. Okay. But you know, that's part of it too. Because of a change in duty station, yes. is that what happened? Yep. Okay. Yep. So she was very, very used to change. Very well yep. organized. Very willing organized. to take on tasks. Yep. So she stood out, and this is a president of a co-op. This is a nonprofit organization. This right. is a big response. This is not just show up once a week and bring cookies. This is no. organizing no. a lot. Right. A lot of I'm, other... I'm the only paid person, so everything else is done through our volunteers. Right. And so as a, as a model, Tito, and since Didi shared with us that, you know, children really learn from how we model ourselves, mm -hmm. and what, what strengths 
do you think from your military experience have been most applicable to helping your children? Maybe not during the first two years, as you mentioned, when, you know, little Tito didn't even know you, but today, what strengths have you been able to share him or share with him? Yeah, no, um, I think those first four years is probably the most difficult, but it's been hard to try to get it to him. Um, why I do things or why I tell him to do things. I mean, before we just get told to do something and you just do it, you don't understand why. And it's hard to, that, that next time a situation comes up, you could do that one thing, but what if the situation is a little bit different? So I try to explain to him, even if I'm upset with him, uh, this is why I do, or this is why you should do this. You know, and this is what you need to look out for so you can make your own decisions and, and, and be your own man, be your own person. Uh, like, like Derek McGinnis, you know, he, he always mm -hmm. tells his kids, be leader, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. be that leader, right. understand right. the situation. And, yeah. and do what's right. So yeah. I think it's one of the biggest things is, is that and just making sure that he understands that, yeah, his little brother is my son, but that's his responsibility too. And he's to take uh, yeah, ownership of watching his brother. I'm really glad you mentioned uh, Derek. He's, he's definitely one of the best models I've ever met in regards to parenting. Yeah. So Derek, if you're out there watching, we also have a caller uh, from Winters and we're gonna go to a break here in a moment. And then we've got a question for you, Tito, on the screen here, but we're gonna take the caller. Are you there, Elise? Hi, good evening, everyone. Hi, Elise. Thank you for so much for calling in tonight. It's great to have you. You were going to be a guest here, and we're really looking forward to it. But as one of the best role models of parenting, you, you went home and to take care of, uh, of your little daughter, Phyllis, in on, on Kenley. Is she okay? She's doing good. We're just trying to break her fever. You might hear okay. the Peppa Pig in the background, so she's laying down on the cap. Uh, and how, tell us a little bit about yourself, Elise, and tell us a little bit about Kenley. I know you're, there's a husband in the picture, too, so fill us there's in on your family. in the picture, yes. So we're a family of three. I've got 12 years under my belt with the military service. I was active duty in the Air Force Forces. Um, uh, we're losing you, Elise. We're gonna we're gonna try again in a second. I don't know if you got a bad uh, reception, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna go to Tito's question here. Hang on the phone, Elise. We're gonna take your question in a minute when we get a better connection. So this question's okay. for you. Oh. This, this question's for you, Tito. Uh, if our production crew could check that call, I appreciate it. So for Tito, how do you become an alpha? without acting like a drill sergeant with your kids. That question must come from an army guy because I think army guys call them <laughs> drill sergeants. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how, so how, do you, how, how do you, I guess, maintain a leadership or maybe a dominant parental, we won't say, you know, father role, because any, but how can you, how do you maintain a dominant parental role if there's even a need to be dominant, but without acting like a drill sergeant? And I think what we mean by that is maybe, being a bit too abrasive, right? Drill sergeants are pretty abrasive. So I was pretty, people. you know, abrasive when I came home. Yeah. Um, I didn't know any better. I'm, I'm, I'm still learning every day, uh, you know, how to be a good father. Um, you have to lead really by, by example of what you want. You know, you, you have to be their example of, of what's right and wrong. And um, I came home thinking, even though he understands what I'm saying, he's still not an adult. He's still a child. And I, I didn't understand that at first. Uh, so it was very rough coming home. So I, I really had to humble myself and and understand that you know I, I'm his protector, not his drill sergeant, his drill instructor. I'm I'm his father. I'm his I'm his role model, and I have to learn that I have to control what's inside me first before I could come and, and talk to him. So I want to come back to that, and I'll, I'll use myself, right? Because I think that I've definitely referenced a lot of that Marine Corps military um, mentality in my role as a parent. Uh, and, but we're going to try to go back to Elise here, and then we're going to take a break, and we'll come back to this topic. And maybe we can help ourselves understand a little bit how that military does influence our, our roles. So, Elise, are you with us? I'm with you. Can All right. You hear me? Yes. Thank you for sticking with us, Elise. So you were starting to say a little bit about your military experience. Yes, so I've got 12 years under my belt, United States Air Force. I was active duty. I'm now in the reserve out of Travis Security Forces. Wow, thank you. And my daughter, Kenley, is three years old. She just turned three a few months ago. And yeah. so we had a bit of a crash course when I did my annual tour in Japan, and it was only for two weeks. That's a long and time. And we tried really hard to talk about it, and we set up festivals so that she Okay. But what I found was even trying to communicate to a three-year-old um, as much as 
if you can and tell me where I'm at and give me her the globe and show me where I'm at, where she's at. Um, she was really mad at me. And yeah. so she would yell at me, you know, no more work, bad mom, come home, mom. And yeah. uh, she really wanted me to come home. So when I came home, it was great. We went right back into our routine. But, but she was pretty angry. She's got a deployment <laughs> coming up in 2018. And oh, wow. I'm just wondering if you have any advice, because as I talk to some of my military friends who have deployed, their experience was similar, That mm. and they said it was almost harder to communicate with their kids, and so they would go long periods before calling them mm. or interacting with them, and that's not something I'm willing to do, mm -hmm. so I didn't know Imagine. if she had any advice, because I want to be on her life as much as I can. So let me just paraphrase here. I'm sure everyone understands the question, but um, so within within three years of her life, she's had to face mom leaving for a couple of weeks, and what you're looking at is in the next year, when she's four years old, she'll be um, facing a deployment. Uh, Kenley will be, and of course you will as well as Elise, Elise and and of course uh, the father will be as well. So. To help us understand a little bit here, Dee Dee, if you don't mind. And feel free to jump in because, Sue, you experienced this, deployments and such. So talking about a three-year-old being angry and no mommy, bad mommy, come back home mommy, what, how is this, what's going through this child's mind at three years old? Well, I think at three, we give them way too many words, explain something too big. Mm -hmm. um, they don't understand it. Okay. And the more that we try and explain it to them, the bigger it gets in their head and the more confusing it gets to them. Okay. And so to try and keep it always much simpler. Okay. You know, and when kids say, I don't like you, I hate you, they are doing that to, to show their independence. They're doing yeah. that to get a reaction. They, okay. they don't. They okay. love you more than anything, which is why they're, they're going to go for the reaction right. to it. Um, you know, ways I would recommend communicating when you're apart would be even simpler than just like trying to talk, but more maybe do the FaceTimes or whatever, but like draw a picture, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, just to where you're kind of doing your communication on a child's level mm -hmm. and not trying to do it as much on, well, I'm your parent and this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you say that. I was actually part of... I was going to make a suggestion. Yeah, cool. um, there, there's a nonprofit out there, but you don't have to get together with a nonprofit to do this, but you can record, you can read a book and record it. And so at night that you can play the recording of you reading the book so she sees you and hears your voice hmm. and um, at least becomes accustomed to that. And that's been very effective with, uh, with, with people that have deployed, so at least they don't lose touch. And she doesn't hear you trying to, she, she hears your voice in a very comforting and, and way that, that means a lot to her because it's a story that she likes and she sees your pictures. Great recommendations. Uh, we're going to have to wrap up this segment. Elise, feel free to stay with us. I know you have to take care of uh, Kenley, but um, thank you for calling in and asking the question. We're going to oh, move you're on. you're welcome. That was great advice, and I'll keep listening to you or yes. watching you guys on the live stream. Please thank do. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Elise. Elise. Bye now. <laughs> We'd now like to share with you a video from Disabled American Veterans, which is the organization that supports military families in times of need. We'd like to give a special... Hello to DAV's Senior Vice Commander, Delphine Metcalf-Foster, who, who is the subject of this video and a local resident. We will be back shortly. My father was in the Spanish-American War, 9th Cavalry, All-African American. My father always said that help someone else. My name is Delphine Metcalf-Foster, United States Army, retired first sergeant. I said, no, I will go in. At the time, my daughter was in high school. Well, she said, everyone's going to laugh. You just can't make it in the military. I said, well, why don't you come go with me? She lasted two weeks, and I lasted 21 years. I had a great registration company for the first Desert Storm, Desert Shield, where I had to take the bodies and put them in the body bags and send them back to the United States. And now, I, I do have the PTSD. There's no prosthetics, you see, but it's something there that will always be there. I met a gentleman that worked for the DAV and found out the great things that they were doing for our veterans, assisting them not only in benefits, but fighting for them in Washington. I said, hmm, a way to help, okay. 
So I joined the DAV because I just saw what they were doing and they were just so positive. DAV has always been on the forefront for women. I am a veteran and my victory is making a difference for other female veterans. Welcome back to Veterans Voices, where tonight we're discussing child development and parenting. A lot of you have been calling in, asking questions. It's great. We've had a, a great conversation so far. And if you'd like to share your story or if you have a question, call, email, or send us an anonymous chat. Now's a chance to do so. And we're now joined by veteran and children's book author Vincent Vargas, who's again joining us tonight uh, via Skype from Texas. Uh, Vincent wrote the book, My Military Dad Does Things a Little Different. And tonight we're giving away a signed copy to our viewers who call or write in. So Vincent, we can see you on the, on the TV there. I assume by your smile you can see us. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Introduce yourself a little bit. I, I, I introduced you as an author. You wrote the book. But uh, tell us a little bit about your military service and about your, your family. Yeah, I'm... Uh... It's see, I've done four years active duty with the 2nd and 75th Ranger Regiment, uh, four kids uh, from my first marriage, and now currently uh, I have a blended marriage with uh, two other kids that brought into the family, so that's six total. Um, I did, I'm still currently in the reserves, uh, like I said, deployed three times. Uh, since then, I did some service with the Homeland Security, and then currently I focus a lot on just being an entrepreneur, uh, that including um, the book writing and stuff like that. So. So no more service, you're out of the reserves, or you're a veteran oh, status I'm now? I'm currently still in the reserves. Okay. Um, I work with the drill sergeant unit here in town. I, uh, that's going to be my 14th year. I'm actually going to extend for the in-depth soon. So. <laughs> wow, what a career. Well, thank you so much. Well, so tell us a little bit about your experiences uh, as a parent. You mentioned you've got a blended family. You've got uh, several different kids. What, what's it like being a a parent. Tell us a little bit about the ages too. How, how young is the youngest and how old is the oldest? So our youngest is three, and then it goes seven, seven, uh, nine, eleven, and fourteen. Um, wow. Well, so I guess my first, you know, my, my four kids come from my first marriage. Uh, you know, that didn't work the way uh, we expected to because of just being active duty, deploying, training, uh, being gone so long. You know, it just kind of it took a toll on the family. Uh, at the time, me being a father, I believed my job was more important to pay the bills and not so much focus on family. I, I felt uh, the need to support them financially was just as important as me being physically there. And uh, after going through my divorce, I, I realized that was kind of the wrong attitude to have. Uh, now I really focus on trying to have more balance in my life. I try and say no to work and family, uh, yes to family more often, and uh, and hopefully keeping that balance is going to keep, keep myself as a, a better father, better uh, husband, as well as more involved in their life. And so that's what I try and tend to do. And so when I wrote this book, it was more focusing on the fact that hopefully having a father or mother sit down with their child and taking the time to explain to them some of the questions that they're going to have in this book. Well, that's great. That's, uh, that's very uh, insightful, Vincent. Tell, me, tell us a little bit about the book and how it's helped within your own family first before it could help with other families. I mean, how did your family, how did your kids react to it? Uh, I think they were pretty excited about it. I had the, uh, the illustrator kind of design the, the four kids after my four kids and kind of some of the things that they've seen throughout my career. I mean, I've been a drill sergeant since 2008, you know, and they've seen things like uh, pointing with a knife hand, you know, that's very common with the military to point with a knife hand. And they probably didn't understand the, the gesture, but uh, being able to explain to them in the book and understanding why dad eats so fast or why, why your father is uh, 10 minutes early to 10 minutes early uh, and things like that. Uh, we had fun just the, uh, about last month when the book came out and we had to proofread it. I sat there with my two youngest boys and they were like, dad, that's you. I was like, yeah, it is. It's me and, <laughs> and many other military uh, men and women in this world. So uh, we, had, we had fun with it. Um, I wanted to write something like I said that it's probably not going to be very clear and defined to most of the children reading the book, but that's what it's there for the parent to sit there and kind of explain. Uh, some of the some of the things that we do just by being part of that military lifestyle and that culture. So there was a question a little bit earlier about, uh, and this question definitely can be answered by you. I think it's it was in regards to how you establish that uh, parental role without 
pulling too much from the military discipline or in your specific instance, <laughs> that role as a drill sergeant. So you, you, you work as a reservist, you put the uniform on, come Friday, you take it off Sunday. How do you transition right. into that role of still serving in the military and how do you transition out of that role or does it just blend? Is there really no transition you know, no. for the person who's serving in the military and who's the parent? I, I think it's all based on good leadership. I think e even in the military and leadership, uh, it's very similar. I, I use the quote, I raise my kids like I raise my soldiers and I raise my soldiers like I raise my kids. And in that sense, uh, you never should be a tyrant in any leadership position. I think if you lead by, uh, by, by, re by earning respect by the individuals, your subordinates or your children, I think you can never go wrong. Uh, you're gonna make decisions that are gonna be beneficial to them. At every time, you're going to try and protect them and put them in the be put them in the best interest. You're going to put them before yourself, and it's the same thing in leadership. You lead from the front and lead by example. And I, I think I discipline my kids when they're wrong, and I praise them when they're right. And the same with my soldiers. And when I, I discipline them when they're wrong, and I praise them when they're right. And, and if you keep it in that sense and in that manner, I believe you're going to do you're going to do the best for them. I think we all make mistakes in leadership and in parenting. Uh, there's no textbook that tells you the proper way of doing anything, but. Uh, if you keep in that sense, you know, you're doing the you're do doing what you can to benefit them, to put them ahead of you. And like I said, in leadership or in raising kids, I think, you know, we're going to do the best thing. I think you'll make a better decision more than you'll make the wrong decision. So, so earlier we were talking with uh, our guests on stage here about uh, the challenges of deployment. And you had mentioned earlier in the discussion about how that had, um, had probably contributed to, to, the, to the breaking up of your family. Um, right. How have you how how have you dealt with that, and in what ways have you earned the trust of your kids now that you're not going to run away on them again? Yeah, it was tough. I think, like I said, it took me a while to kind of earn that father role. You know, to, for them to identify me as dad, and in, in the respect of their friends around them, that they have their father there daily. Um, they understand my job. I try and explain it to them. But I think what, what's helped me and I, many other families is technology. I can actually now go face to face with them. I could actually reach them over Skype or over FaceTime. And that's definitely changed the relationship. Now I have to make a conscious decision to call them every night, whether it's FaceTime or make that phone or make that text to my older daughter who does have a cell phone this time. I think that's changed the game for a lot of us uh, overseas. I mean, there's, there's very little delay these days. And so it's changed everything where they can understand, they can see what I'm doing, and it's not just a figment of their imagination and just saying, where's dad? Well, he's not here. Well, dad's going to call tonight or dad's going to call next week. At least now you're still involved. And, and I'm saying technology is, is, has made things, I wouldn't say better, but it did make it easier. Uh, Raymond, are you there? Yeah, I am here. Okay, Raymond, you got a question for our guest. Go ahead. Yes, uh, my question is this. Um, I'm the Coast Guard, and you know, I was on ships and stuff, and I didn't have any dependents while in, but did you have any rituals when you got home from deployment? Good question. Very good question. So, Vincent, I don't know if you heard that, but I'm going to repeat it just for all of our audience and even for our guests here on the stage, too, because we've got um, some perspectives here on the stage. Were there any particular rituals that were used for coming home from a deployment? Uh, not personally in my family. I think I like to do holidays, and every holiday we do it as extreme as possible. So I think, uh, you know, my family's used to sitting down at the table and eating dinner together. It's a very older tradition, and, and I try and maintain that from something I was raised in doing. Uh, the things like Christmas, I mean, decorating the tree. Like today, we bake cookies as a family today, and it's small traditions like that. What we try and maintain, uh, I currently still travel quite a bit because I do a lot of public speaking. And so when I do come home or the day before I leave, I make sure we take a family dinner. You know, they kind of know what I'm going. They know why I'm doing it. And, I, again, I just try and be very open to them and explain to them what, what dad does, you know. That open communication, I feel, has is, is helped a lot. Awesome. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, did that help, uh, I, I, Raymond? Raymond, did, any follow-up questions? Uh, follow-up questions? No, I just want to say uh, thank you for your service. Yeah, thanks so much, Raymond, for calling in the show. That was interesting, and uh, it sounds like it worked out okay. Vincent, you could hear him. I, I've got a, another question, and this kind of came from earlier a comment, and Dee, Dee, feel free to jump back in here, and Sue, feel, feel free to jump <coughs> in here, that um, a, a lot of the times the family shows a, a certain 
capacity for being maybe a little bit more organized or a little bit more motivated than some of the other spouses. Uh, Vincent, and again, Sue, you jump in here. Uh, have you noticed anything about your kids when they were in the school? Did they, did they show up a little bit more seriousness, seriousness in the classroom or were they a little bit better about cleaning up their room than say any other kid of their age? I just know my kids have a different, I guess, idea of, uh, I can see how they handle um, their emotions differently than most kids, you know, from just being raised by someone like me. Um, you know, I tell them, you know, I, it's kind of the tough way of raising them. I, I don't, you don't need to cry unless I see t uh, blood. Kind of like, it's a real tough kind of <laughs> way of being raised. Um, you know, I'm an infantry guy, I'm an army ranger, I was a drill sergeant, so uh, it wasn't easy in our household. You know, they had, they had to clean their rooms, everyone had their chores at a young age, so they definitely know responsibility. They're definitely more independent than most children. They all know self-defense very well because they've been around, you know, jiu-jitsu and boxing and wrestling, and so definitely they've been raised slightly different than the average bear, but uh, I think what's gone, what they have more than anyone is probably the independence. You know, they, they know how, you know, I've given them that. I, I, I'm I okay with them having failure. I'm okay with them losing as long as they understand they go 100% and they go, you know, they do their best because building resiliency in our kids is probably the most important thing we can give them. Uh, I think that's what we've lost a lot in these these, these few years or these this past, this next generation mm -hmm. doesn't have the resiliency mm -hmm. that some of us have had. We have a phone call from Florida for you from a gentleman named Robert. Robert, are you with us? Hey, how's it going? Good, good. Can you hear him, Vince? Yes. I can hear you. Can Go you ahead. Me? What's your question, Robert? Hey, so uh, how does an Army Ranger go from uh, being a tough guy to writing a kid's book? <laughs> 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 well, I think... Um, the idea with this, I mean, throughout throughout the years of life, I've been softened through having kids and, and, and having to give my emotions back to them. I also think, you know, there's many sides of me and like there's any of us, you know, that's being an Army Ranger was one chapter in my life. Being a father is a major chapter in my life and being an author is going to just be another chapter. Uh, I'm just trying to be successful in any, any lane that I choose. I felt like if I can give life lessons of mine, through children's books, maybe I can help other veterans like me go through some of the struggles and hopefully they can learn from my mistakes and maybe not make the same mistakes I've made. That's great. Any, anything else, Robert? No, that's it. Well, I thank you very much for calling in. So before we go away, I want to, uh, our marketing coordinator here, Vincent, said that uh, I was to make sure to take a slow drink. I see it. <laughs> on my mug here. And uh, and uh, appreciation for having you on the show. So thank you so much for your time. We're out of time for this segment. And, uh, we'll, you know, we didn't get much chance for our uh, panel to provide any expertise. But I want to say one last comment. You know, it's a good thing you made the children's book. If I was to make a children's book, all the pictures would be stick figures. So I'm glad <laughs> someone out there who's a combat veteran is taking the time to uh, really Absolutely. help families and help children understand, you know, the military service uh, that the parents go through. So and thank Vince, you. I think you're a tremendous example of what can be done when you put your priorities in the right in the right sequence and I, I just want to applaud you for that for putting your priorities in a sequence that uh, that means that not only are you helping your children but you're helping other people's children too so thank you very much for that I appreciate it thank you for having me Last year, Veterans Voices had the chance to catch up with General James Mattis while he was giving a talk at the Marine Memorial Club in San Francisco. As you may know, General Mattis is being uh, considered for Secretary of Defense, so we felt this video was timely to share again with you. We will return shortly with more discussion on our topic, and we'll be taking your calls during the break. For the veterans of the Iraq and Afghan wars, of these very poorly explained and inconclusive wars, 
of the first major wars that we have fought in our country's history without a draft forcing some men into the ranks. It's understandable that the question of our service and what it meant may loom very large in our minds, for you most assuredly put something in to our country's moral bank. Memories of our time overseas remains with us, recalling to mind ourselves and our comrades when we were younger and we will, were willing to give our all for this country and especially, especially for our buddies. These memories are often infrequent, excuse me, are often frequent if unbidden. You may be home for the holidays and you hear duck hunters shoot in the distance. And for just a minute you alert, you glance over to see if your lieutenant or your squad leader's coming with that kind of alertness that means grab your gear. And then you hear your family's voices in the background and you relax, smiling to yourself and you rejoin their conversation as if nothing happened. In my case, it's natural too, ladies and gentlemen, when I think of veterans, to think of our country because they are inextricably linked in my heart and in my mind. I, I have not found any challenges. I've enjoyed every minute of it. I love getting out. <clears throat> I, I enjoy not having to get my hair cut quite so often. And, uh, but I also uh, kept all the military things with me. I keep working out, kind of keep me motivated each day. Go out and do my three mile run and just kind of enjoy life. Uh, all, the, all the freedoms that we fought for when we were on active duty. So just go out there and enjoy every day in the greatest country on earth. Life and all right, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed that. That, of course, was General Mad Dog Mattis. And uh, many of us are excited about his future opportunity to become Secretary of the Defense. So we'll see how that plays out. And we had such an uh, opportunity to interview him, a wonderful opportunity. And we want to thank the Marines Memorial Association in San Francisco for that opportunity. Uh, we're kind of ad-libbing here because we've had such a interactive episode uh, a lot of people are calling in asking questions we've got a few that haven't quite yet fed themselves in to the to the episode so we'll get to them and we've got more content for our set to share so we're skipping over unfortunately our a veterans voice segment uh in which we we're going to have denny and uh rod uh share their their perspective as a veterans voice but we will get back to denny and, and rod in a future episode of veterans voices uh, we also want to share with you that we're considering the idea of changing the show to another night. Uh, we want to consider whether a Tuesday, Wednesday, or a Thursday night would be a better night for our audience. So if you have some input or feed, uh, feedback on that, we welcome that. Otherwise, stay tuned for uh, some future changes. It's because our ratings are so high, we're going to a better night. That's right? absolutely right. So, Sue, let's come back to you uh, and your experiences with with deployments. You, you were saying earlier before we started the show that sometimes you had just a couple of hours to find out about your husband deploying. So yes. how did that, you, as a parent, how did you have to adjust because you were assuming both roles when your husband was gone, right? Yes. Um, it was hard, but um, we got through it. Um, the kids didn't quite understand though, and they kind of withdrew a little bit. Um, because they didn't understand because mm -hmm. Millie, of course, was only four oh, that's and yeah. my son was only a couple months old. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as for myself, it wasn't the only fact that my husband was being deployed in a couple hours, but I also had to take another role on as okay. a senior NCO wife mm. and uh, help guide and uh, get other wives to adjust to the fact that their spouses were not going to be there to help, you know. Mm -hmm. um, my main thing was to put my attention to other things other than what was happening to my family. Mm -hmm. And um, I did have a hard time at first getting my two children to understand okay. that their dad was not going to be coming into the door in a couple hours, you know. Or um, if you do something wrong, you know, daddy's not going to be there to tell you no, no, you know, mm -hmm. for a little while. But um, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. During that time, did you find, and Tito, feel free to jump in here, did you find that during deployments or just being away, did you feel that like you were spending more time with your children? Or was there any kind of intentional um, behaviors that were, you know, maybe? 
paying a little bit more attention to their emotions, or were you trying to just carry on life as usual to no, maybe no, not no. make it seem any different for them? No. My daughter, she was four, and she went back to the miserable twos <laughs> when her dad left. Okay. Yeah. I mean, daddy was her life. She's, she wrapped herself totally around him. And um, him not being there, you know, with her, um, like when she got hurt or when she needed him, like she, right. he used to tuck her into bed, oh. but now mommy's doing yeah. it instead. Right. Different. And uh, so we have a caller for, we have that has a question for you. I don't mean to cut you off, but I okay. really want this caller to get in here because right. we had some great questions. And Courtney, thank you for calling too. Although the content wasn't relevant to tonight, we've got Lena on the phone. And so Lena, thank you for joining us. And you have a question for Sue. Hi, this question is uh, for Sue. Yes, hi, thanks for joining us. What's your question? Hi, Sue. I wanted to know um, how you handle your um, daughter being away in Afghanistan. Like, how do you deal with mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I can't say that I'm used to it because it's happened to me before. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's the same song. No, on, on the holidays, it's really bad. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm used to her... Like coming, hey, my, it's time to put up the tree, you mm -hmm. know, and this mm -hmm. is the way I want it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, my son-in-law and I put it together with her. She was on Skype. I think that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. And uh, she joined in with us, and we didn't put the ornaments where she wanted them, but that's no. okay. It, it's still up. You know, absolutely. And, uh, Did you take a picture of it for her? Yeah. yeah. I mean, she was on the camera. Well, that's, she that's was on the, the phone. Technology, as we were talking yeah, about before, yeah. as Vince was, was reflecting yeah, she was, on, the technology she was right today there. makes it a lot. Easier. Yeah, she was right there with us yeah. as we were in telling us where to put everything. I think Lena's question is so important, though, because it kind of brought me into the world of, that's right, you're still a veteran. I mean, you're still a parent. <laughs> yeah. And you're yeah. still the parent of now a child that is deployed in um, Afghanistan. I'm dealing, I'm dealing with it like most parents would. You know, um, I'm doing other things. I work as well, and I, I think I work too much. But it's mm. my way of dealing with her not being here. I am overwhelmed when she calls. I'm the first one on that phone. You know, mm -hmm. hey, Billy, you know, mm -hmm. like she called me tonight before we came on to the oh, show. Wow. And uh, she was sharing with me, and I go, Millie, you look like you just got out of bed. She goes, Mom, I did. <laughs> and she's trying to brush her hair, you know, because we're taking the phone around and letting everybody visit with her. Um, yeah, I miss her a lot. I mean, I she's, she's my baby, you know, and, um, but she's okay. Yeah, she is. God's watching over, and he'll he'll bring her home to me. She's had great training. That's the best thing. Oh yeah, yeah. She's she's been around the block a couple of times. And it really makes me think about our Blue Star families that are out there that yeah. are going through this right now. Their sons yeah. and daughters are serving in the military, and they're very much moms and dads still. They're still the parent. Yep. Yeah. So I hope I answered your question. I I don't know what the I can't pinpoint it. You know, I'm I'm a human being. Yeah, I think we got a good sense. Yeah. Yeah, I also other? wanted to add, um, do you have any other advice for any parents out there that do have their kids that are in the military that are away? Any advice you want to give them? Well, you know, the best, best advice that I can give you is put the shoe on the other foot. It could be worse, you know, and, and, and there's probably some, a lot of people out there that need help. Just focus on, you know, putting your work and your needs and your thoughts to others, as well as your family. Mm. And keep yourself busy. Okay. True military style. <laughs> Don't <laughs> think of I yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Put it all aside. Work hard. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, that's the, that's the mechanism that you've had to develop of years yes. of being a parent and with your husband deploying and just being in, you know, doing the duties of, of the military it. and then now your daughter. So. Well, yes. Lena, I want to thank you very much for your phone call. <laughs> yeah, Lena, thank you oh, for welcome. joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sue. You're welcome. Tito, you experienced experience some of that too. Was, um, um, not, not obviously, your kids aren't deployed, but, but of coming back and having to, to readjust to. Um, Let's explore that a little bit though, yeah. because, because oftentimes the question is asked, well, would you let your own kids go in the military, right? Like that's often, so having served in the military, when, you know, Tito's only what, 10 years old? 10 years old. 
So that you know that that's eight years down the road. But yeah. what about eight years from now? What if what if Tito comes to you and says, "Hey, Dad, I want to join the the Navy or the Marine Corps or whatever branch." I mean, what are your thoughts on that as a parent, as a veteran? I've always tried to not think about that. What's going to happen when that time comes? Because there's no telling what he would want to do. Um, I would have to let him be his own person if that's what I would give him exactly what I've experienced. Uh, I'm, I never lie to him. I, if he's old enough to ask a question, I, I give him the straight answer. So if he wants to join the Marines, the Navy, Air Force, Army, I'm going to tell him what it is. And then if he still wants to do it, hey, good, good, good to go, son. I mean, but try the college route first. See, see if that works out for you. Now, yeah. I, I try to deter him a little bit, but yeah. if it doesn't take, he's just like me. We're, we're, gonna, we're headstrong. We're going to go. If I try to tell him not to do it, he's going to do it. I think it's all kids. You know? Does he ask questions about it? Does, I mean, my kids don't the three and six, but, you know, T Tito's 10 years old. He Tenure. plays G.I. Joe's or something. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. He's got a girlfriend. He might be a little old for G.I. Joe. But, you know, does he see pictures of you up on the wall and say, hey, Daddy, you know, tell me about this? Not as much. Uh, he, he wasn't old enough the first deployment, but the second one, he, he was four years old. He, he understood that I was leaving. Uh, he'd asked his questions, but it's been long past. It's, he's moved on. So, so we have a question here that just came through via um, uh, social media or through chat, and it says, what kind of mental health services does the DOD or the VA provide to dependent families during the active duty parent deployment? Well, if it's active duty, the VA the VA is probably not going to be too much involved because that's for veterans, um, but um, each independent unit has experts that work uh, within there, which is what Sue was rela re uh, re relating to earlier, um, in that the individual unit will have um, resources available to them that they can provide to the families for support while, during, a, during a deployment. And, and let's just real quickly, because we often think of, you know, for the military family, it must be a military resource. But what about community resources, Didi? What, what resources do you think are available for military families or veterans who are parents that aren't related to the VA, but just write it, you know, in the, in the community itself? Well, the um, crisis center is a huge, they offer so many benefits, I mean, from nutrition to mm. counseling to picking a preschool to, I mean, so many resources are available okay. right there. Um, school districts offer a lot of resources, right. which you might not think, right. they, but they right. actually do. Right. Um, so going to the principal or someone, a counselor? No, you would go to the... Um, like the assessment centers and stuff like that of, okay. of the school district, not to the, not really to the principal, unless you were trying to maybe help your child figure something out that you needed to go to the principal for. Good, good. And I think if you're involved with the church or if you, a church, right? Right. Any, any, Absolutely. Not, not even particular yeah. religion, but any, next door. any, any, yeah. you know, any place right. where you can go and get good advice and good yeah. counseling right. and good solid right. support. I think you need to sur surround yourself with with that support system. Well, we're unfortunately out of time on this topic, but I want to thank our guests so much. And I want to thank all of our audience members who watched our show tonight, who called in fantastic questions, comments. I think it was a very engaging conversation. And really, we could have spent three hours talking about and, this. And especially thank Vincent for his contribution. And thank you, tonight. Vincent, for dialing in all the way from Texas. And, uh, you know, speaking of resources, it's a good way to transition because there are many benefits and resources for parents and children out there. Here are a few that might help you. The college tuition fee waiver a very important benefit for veterans who are service connected. It waives the fees at California public universities. For more, for more information, to see if you're eligible, go to calvet.ca.gov and click on the education tab. For information on the Veterans Affairs, Survivors, and Dependents Assistance, go to contracosta.ca.gov forward slash vets. CHAMP VA, it's a civilian health and medical program offered by the VA. They share the cost of health care services for eligible beneficiaries, which are family members of veterans who are permanently and totally disabled. Go to va.gov for more information. Head Start promotes school readiness of young children from low-income families. For more information, call or visit www.ehsd.org forward slash Head Start. First Five California provides free resources to aid in children's development from zero to five years. Go to www.ccfc.ca.gov for more information. Military OneSource is a central hub of information 
education for the military community. Find info on benefits, education, and parenting resources at militaryonesource.mil. My office, the Contra Costa County Veterans Service Office, can assist you with benefits, connect you with resources, and help determine your eligibility for some of these great VA programs. Go to ContraCosta.ca.gov or call 925-313-1481. There are many organizations you can get involved with to help a military family this holiday season. Operation Homefront helps military families during difficult financial times. For support or to donate, visit OperationHomefront.net or call the number on your screen. The Red Cross has served more than a million families since 9-11. Assistance for families during deployments as well as relief to veterans are just some of the ways that this organization can help. Visit redcross.org for more information. Habitat for Humanity's Veterans Build Initiative provides volunteer home ownership, volunteer home ownership and employment opportunities to veterans and military families. Type in Veterans Build at habitat.org for more information. Tonight, we have the honor of displaying a shadow box from World War II Navy veteran in Pearl Harbor. May I mention is the 75th anniversary recently of Pearl Harbor. And this survivor's name is Carl Slattengren. If you like your memorabilia featured on our show, we feature a new shadow box every month. Call or write in. Thank you to all our guests tonight for this discussion. You can rewatch this show, check back on our website's homepage later this week, or your cable provider's schedule for Rebross Times. We hope you have a wonderful holiday season, and we will see you in 2017. This is Veterans Voices of Contra Costa wishing you all a good evening, and thank you for serving.